Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who gets along fine with modern living. Here is the captain. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week in the garage, we are happy to be featuring Candy Corn Cheesecake Sour Ale by the wild and fun folks over at Weldworks Brewing Company in Greenlee, Colorado. This is a sour ale with candy corn, cream cheese, graham cracker, vanilla, and milk sugar. So quite complex, my friends. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And how about a little happy Halloween to our friends. Cheers to Mari Young in Fort William, Scotland. And last but certainly not least, we have Scott T. Balmer, a veteran listening in very spooky parts unknown. So a big shout out to Mari and Scott and a big cheers to all of our veterans. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N, beer run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, make sure you sign up to listen to Off the Record on Patreon or through the Apple Podcast app, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. According to several publications, but specifically the Encyclopedia for Intrapersonal Violence, familicide is a type of murder or murder-suicide in which an individual kills multiple close family members in quick succession, most often children, spouses, siblings, or parents. In half of the cases, the killer lastly kills themselves in a murder-suicide. In cases where all members of a family are killed, the crime may be referred to as a family annihilation. According to experts cited in a 2007 San Francisco Examiner article, of the over 900 victims of mass murder in the United States between the years of 1900 and 2000, defined as four victims within a 24-hour period, Of those, more than half occurred within an immediate family. Although the familicide cases are relatively rare, they are the most common form of mass killings. But familicide differs from other forms of mass murder in that the murderer kills family members or loved ones rather than anonymous people. This has a different psychodynamic and psychiatric significance, as stated in the book Homicide, A Psychiatric Perspective. And finally, the Howard Journal of Criminal Justice, an academic journal published on behalf of the Howard League for Penal Reform in the UK five times a year. The authors of the journal divide familicide into four groups, anomic, disappointed, self-righteous, and paranoid. In this typology, the anomic killer sees his family purely as a status symbol. When his economic status collapses, he sees them as surplus to requirements or no longer needed or necessary. The disappointed killer seeks to punish the family for not living up to the ideals of family life. The self-righteous killer destroys the family to exact revenge upon one of the family members and often blames the act on that family member. Lastly, we have the paranoid killer who kills their family in what they imagine to be an attempt to protect them from something even worse. Some cases that we have featured here in the garage related to this type of killer are Charles Whitman, the University of Texas Tower Shooter, Jeffrey McDonald, the Fatal Vision Fort Bragg killer, Bradford Bishop, the Bethesda, Maryland man who killed his entire family and still remains at large. 
Darlie Rotier, who remains locked up in Texas for killing two of her children. The Grant Amato House of Horrors case, the Watts family murders, and the Murdaugh murders all come to mind. I am probably blanking on one or two others. This week's case takes us to 313 Carl Drive in Bloomington, Illinois, where a very similar crime may have taken place. But yet here we sit, years, decades later, with questions. It is not so much the what that happened inside of that home, but the why and by who. What could be the motive for such a heinous and brutal set of crimes? Multiple murders. And who did this? And will we ever know for certain? This is an examination of the Hendricks family murders case. And this is True Crime Garage. Susan Lois Palmer was born in Peoria, Illinois on September 15, 1953 to proud parents Charles and Nadine Palmer. How do I know, Captain, that Charles and Nadine Palmer were proud parents? Well, they had seven children together. Charles, who went by the name of Chuck, served this great country in the Army Reserves at Fort Hood, Texas from 1949 to 1951. And then at the age of 18, Chuck was saved and became a Christian. He was associated with the Plymouth Brethren Fellowship in Devlin, Illinois. So he and Nadine were and still are quite religious and raised their children to be so as well. Their wonderful daughter, Susan, grew up religious as well and carried that with her into her adult life. We also have David James Hendricks. He grew up in Oak Park, Illinois. He and his family were members of the exclusive branch of the Plymouth Brethren. Susan Palmer and David Hendricks met at Oak Park River Forest High School. So, Captain, from my understanding here, the way that this works out, both of these families are very religious in this group called the Plymouth Brethren. Now, the two of them, even though they're the same age and they're practicing the same very specific group of Christianity, they don't know one another because Devlin, where Susan lives, is about 35 minutes away from where David Hendricks is growing up. So they meet at high school, but that is because Susan was taking correspondence classes. And what I think that means here, Captain, is that she's probably homeschooled for a portion, if not most, of her childhood but it was required that she actually go to and take an actual be present for in a classroom before she could graduate from high school. So she has to take this course, at least one course or maybe several courses at the same high school as David Hendricks, her senior year. She makes this achievement and she graduates, but while there, the two meet and From my understanding, Susan was David's first real girlfriend, and they became very close very quickly. After high school, the two got married. David went to school to learn prosthetics and orthotics. He and Susan were blessed enough to have three wonderful children together. We have Rebecca Karen Hendricks, born in 1974, Grace Esther Hendricks, born in 1976, and Benjamin Caleb Hendricks, born 1978. So all three children born two years apart. So the two high school sweethearts, they get married, husband goes off to school, and then after school, he is going to start his business. Yeah, During this time of new babies and raising young kids together, David Hendricks started a prosthetic orthotic practice. He also invented a new orthopedic brace and started its successful business manufacturing and distributing spinal braces. This would be his claim to fame, as it would seem. So 
what he does here, Captain, is he starts up this practice, and during this time, he's selling medical supplies as well as the spinal braces that is his speciality or his expertise. And he's quite successful. He's a very smart individual and he's a very good salesperson as well. So he's smart with the business and sales come pretty easy to David Hendricks. Now, David had his, what I believe is called a chair back brace that he patented. He founded and operated a highly successful and profitable business in Bloomington, Illinois, selling that orthopedic back brace that he had patented. Because of David's patented design, his intelligence, hard work, and let's not forget about his wife's support and dedication to their children, David ends up being very successful, making a lot of money during this time period, the mid to late 70s and early 80s. Due to his success and his growing family and a desire to raise their kids in a nice neighborhood and community, the Hendrickses bought and moved into a large house at a then new development in Bloomington, Illinois. So he's a very successful young man, has a young family, and they move into a better, I guess, location for their kids, for them to raise their family. Yeah, this was a newly developed neighborhood. So when they move in there, it's a new build. It's a very large home or or a larger home. This is considered to be an upper middle class neighborhood. But when they're there, Captain, they are still building and developing this neighborhood. So there are homes and vacant lots, but there are also homes that are still being built around this time because this is going to take us up to 1983. So all of this achievement by the Hendrixes is is complete and done and all the success by a relatively young age. So now it's 1983 and Susan was just 30 years old. David was 29, almost 30. The children, we have Rebecca, who is now nine. Grace is seven. And the youngest, Benjamin, is just five years old. Well, now that we get to November of 1983, having talked about all of this, everything should be peaches and cream. This should be pie in the sky type stuff. Here we have the Hendricks family of five devout religious folks, successful kids growing up, plenty of money, living in a larger home in a great community. David has made enough money to not only provide to a high degree for his family, but also for recreation as well. He has a motorcycle. He has his pilot's license and owns a small airplane. This is the white picket fence American dream playing out right in front of your eyes. Well, that is until everything comes crashing down. This is because at approximately 10.30 p.m. on Tuesday, November 8th, 1983, Susan Hendricks, a 30-year-old housewife, and her three children were discovered slain in the Hendricks family home by Bloomington police. The victims were all bludgeoned to death, found in their beds. The husband and father, David Hendricks, was out of state in nearby Wisconsin on a business trip. A Bloomington police officer was at the Hendricks house when, according to the Chicago Tribune, The officer entered the house through a rear door. This is a sliding glass door at the back of the house. I want to be very clear about something here, Captain, because there are several accounts of the officer entering the home. Right. So we have a sliding glass door at the back of the house. This door is inside of a screen and porch. So the officer had to go into the screen and porch and then finds this glass door either opened or unlocked. What we do know is the door had to be unlocked because this is how the officer made his way into the home. I'm clarifying this because I do believe it has significant relevance to the case and possibly some of the evidence in this case. Right. The two different accounts are one that the officer found the door unlocked. The other account is that he found it unlocked and slightly open. 
and both sources are very respectable sources. So I have a hard time figuring out which one is the most correct here. But regardless, we know that he enters the screen and porch and he finds this back door unlocked. He enters the home. And in fact, we already have some of the Hendrix's relatives on the scene shortly after the police officer arrives. He's actually startled by the family members. And he, you know, he turns and he shines his flashlight. Who's there? You know, it's pitch black out. And he's responding to this call at this home at 313 Carl Drive. And when he shines the flashlight, he's looking at two individuals that are shining a flashlight at him. And one of them speaks up and says, my sister lives here. And with me is my brother-in-law. We came to check on them as well. Right. So now we have a situation where this officer is there checking on this family. Family members are also there at the same time checking on the family. The officer tells the two individuals, and very rightfully so, you don't. if this is going to be a crime scene, we don't know what we're walking into. If this is going to be a crime scene, we don't want to contaminate this crime scene at all. He very astutely tells those two individuals, you guys are going to have to stay out here. I'm going inside and I'd like you to stay out here for fear that you might see or encounter something that you wish you had not seen or encountered. Yeah. And we just need to back up for one quick second because why is the police officer there in the first place? The police officer is there because he is doing, performing a welfare check on the home. Right. The police station, the Bloomington police station has received multiple calls from different family members requesting that someone check or look for Susan and the kids. So some of these calls came from husband David Hendricks, who's out of state on a business trip, and some of these calls came from their relatives. So police are responding to multiple calls to check on these individuals. Put yourself in the shoes of that law enforcement officer. You're doing a welfare check. You're going around the house. You either find that sliding glass door open or you find it unlocked. You go in the house and pretty quickly he discovers one of the family members have been murdered. So he's going to have to call that in to the station. Yeah, he walks into a pitch black house and using his flashlight, he navigates his way through the home. It's reported that he entered the master bedroom first after making his way through the home while on his way there, he does note that the, the house appears to be messy, maybe even potentially ransacked. But again, he's simply just using his flashlight, not flipping on any lights as he goes. And when he makes his way to the master bedroom, he sees what he believes is somebody sleeping in the bed, lying still in the bed. And he's shining his flashlight in. And the officer, when he gives this, gives us his account of the events of that night. He says, look, I've responded on many of these welfare calls, many of these welfare checks, the overwhelming majority of the time, there's nothing wrong at all. Right. Right. Usually like somebody left a phone off the hook, or maybe there's a situation where one family member is mad at the other and is calling to try to check on them and can't get a hold of them. So sends the police to the house. That's commonly what happens according to this officer in this area. Bloomington's a very safe area, and we'll get into crime trends here as we go. But he says the the only thing he ever worried about on these welfare checks when he finds himself actually entering the home was that he was going to encounter a sleeping individual that's going to pull a gun or a shotgun on him because they think he's an intruder. Right. And so he's a little hesitant as soon as he notices that there's someone in this bed. But then by the time that he shines his light and that beam of light makes its way up to the upper portion of the the person or the figure that's lying in that bed, he can see from afar that this individual has been been physically attacked and very brutally attacked and is no longer alive. It's that obvious to the officer in that moment. And so he retreats outside, calls in the backup. Everybody's now on scene. And remember that's at 10 30 between 10 30 and 11 30 PM. Here's what goes down. Susan Hendricks is discovered, killed, slain in her bed. 
the police are now on scene searching the property. They're looking for evidence. They're trying to figure out what happened and who is responsible, who could be responsible. What they find, Captain, is unfortunately they find all three of the children dead as well. So the daughters shared a bedroom. They each have their own bed in this bedroom. The little boy has his own bedroom. They find the two girls in each of their beds, and one and the boy is in one of the girls' beds. They're all in very bad shape. They're all dead upon arrival. And now we have not only police there, but we have detectives, investigators there. They are processing the scene, as it were. The extended family, Susan's brother, who was on scene that we talked about, and brother-in-law have been notified as to what the police have found. We now have Susan's parents there as well, and now David Hendricks arrives at the house. So all of this happens very quickly between 10.30 and 11.30 p.m. on that cold November night in 1983. So sometime before 11.30 p.m. that night, Captain, Mr. David Hendricks arrives home shortly thereafter, only to find police tape surrounding the property and his family dead. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Onward and upward. Cheers to you, Colonel. Yes, cheers to you, Captain. Power to the people. Cheers to the people in the back. So what do we know right away from this situation? What is the information provided to us by police, neighbors, and family immediately after that horrific find? Well, we know this. Bloomington, Illinois at the time is a city of about 40,000 people located about 130 miles southwest of Chicago, Illinois. And leading up to this event, the crime trends that we were able to find statistics on in the five years prior to 1983, Bloomington, Illinois experienced 30 murders. Now, this city and these officers would go on to tell us, not just in 1983, but even years later, that none of them in their careers had ever experienced a quadruple homicide. Right. None of them in their decades experience as an officer or detective had ever experienced a triple homicide. And only a few of them had ever even experienced a double homicide. So this is, murder is is somewhat rare but not unheard of in Bloomington, Illinois at this time. But this type of case, this type of investigation is extremely rare, not just in Bloomington, Illinois, but thankfully everywhere. According to the early reports, the Hendricks family was murdered either late Monday, November 7th, or early morning Tuesday, November 8th, 1983. This is established easily due to several facts. One, we know that David left for Wisconsin late Monday night. He says his family were all in their beds when he left, safe and sound. They were all found still lying in their beds, with the exception of the boy who was in the girls' room. David and others, several others, tried on several occasions on Tuesday to call and speak with Susan. No one ever answered the phone. We learned that the kids did not attend school on that Tuesday. The school principal says the kids did not attend school, but he was not concerned or alarmed by the absence as he assumed maybe they were traveling. This is what we need to discuss here, Captain, is business trips. So David Hendricks had a business. And at one point, he had a practice where he's selling medical supplies and specifically his back brace that he's designed. He's he's the designer and the manufacturer of this back brace. Right. So he's a 
business owner, but this is a business where you have to travel quite often. Correct. At one time he had, he had a practice where you would come in and he would actually have patients and he would outfit you or suggest, Hey, you need these crutches or you may need this wheelchair or here's this back brace. And he would not only attempt to, he's not a doctor per se, but he would treat you and outfit you for whatever equipment medical equipment or supplies that you may need to help you with your day to day. And at this point in 1983, he's not only successful because of this back brace, but that previous company was successful to which he was able to sell that at a profit. So somebody comes in and takes over that business, buys it from him, and they're running the old outfit that he had. At this point in his life, this back brace is so successful that he is simply operating a business where he is now a salesman. Okay. He doesn't take on any patients. He doesn't see, you don't come in and talk to David Hendricks, right? You go to your local doctor, you go to your local physician, your family doctor, and he travels around to different States talking to these doctors, talking to these medical practices and hospitals and saying, Oh, by the way, my David, David Hendricks, I have this, back brace that's really helpful. It's really great. Everybody's buying it. And so he travels around and he is actually selling this back brace and notifying these different practices and hospitals that look, you don't have to get this from some middleman. You can call me up and get it directly from me. You can place orders directly with me, saving you and your patients and your clients money and time and making me very successful as well. So his business at this point, Captain, primarily is him traveling around and networking and passing out business cards and pamphlets and letting people test out his product. So a business trip is relatively common for David Hendricks. Right. On top of that, about half of the time, he will take his family with him, his wife is a housewife. She's a stay at home mother at this point. The three children are still pretty young. And as we can, as we can infer here from what the principal of their school is saying, I will say this. I'm a little clueless if the boy, because he was only five, if he was actually in kindergarten at that time right. and attending that school. But we do know the two daughters were, and what we can infer here from what the principal is saying, he's saying, well, they didn't come to school, but we had no cause for alarm because I just assumed that they were traveling, that they were out with dad on the road for a day trip or for two days on the road for one of these short trips. Now, we should also talk about here, David does have a small plane that he owns and he will fly this in and out of a local plane hangar. He did not take this plane on this trip. He would on some trips, he would take the airplane. And about half the trips, he would not take the airplane. Right. For this trip, he left the night before and he took his vehicle, his personal vehicle. So picture this. Within a 24-hour time period, this guy leaves his house and now he's back at his house. The rest of the family has been killed and now he's surrounded by friends and family inside the home, very much like what we had with the John Bonet case, if people remember that one. And police are now looking at this guy saying, well, we want to talk to you. So here's some other things that back up that timeline of, of when they were killed. Not only did the kids not attend school that day, but we have neighbors who say that a neighbor kid, one of, the, one of their sons, knocked on the front door of the Hendricks home around 11 a.m. on that Tuesday. No one answered the door. David tried calling the house around 9 a.m. that morning because now he's in Wisconsin. When he didn't get through during a check-in phone call with his secretary, so he's on the phone with his secretary slash assistant who is back in Bloomington. And the assistant after talking to David says, Oh, you didn't get a hold of your wife. And he said, no, I tried calling her. I wanted to tell her what hotel I was, could have been a motel hotel, whatever. 
wanted to tell her where I was staying so she could get a hold of me. This is 1983. He doesn't have a cell phone. Right. Hotel, motel, Holiday Inn. That's right. So he's, uh, some of these calls, he's going to make multiple calls throughout the day. And some of them will be to his home. And we do know we have at least two times that he's on the phone with his assistant. Some of these calls are going to come from his hotel room. Some of these calls will come from a pay phone. But his assistant, who's worked for him for a very long time, in fact, in 1983, she is the only full-time employee that works for very successful David Hendricks at this time. Right, because he doesn't, he doesn't have a store. He's just driving around selling his product. Well, his expertise is making this product and selling it to people. Yeah. You need somebody else that can handle all the other day-to-day operations that's very good and very smart at that stuff. But also, if you're traveling a lot, you need somebody to help you with the the booking and the exact itinerary, and then probably making uh, arrangements to meet these different doctors and the you know set up the different meetings at the different facilities. And so she says, you know, you're going to be out there on the road. He's not going out there just to hit one facility or go to one hospital or one practice and try to sell his product. He's going to be out on the road, hitting several different practices. And he's actually going to hit several different cities in the state of Wisconsin. So she says, David, don't worry about it. I will get a hold of Susan. I'll get her on the phone and I'll let her know where you're staying. And I will pass along your, the phone number to the hotel where you are staying. So now that's her job for the day. She says that she made multiple attempts throughout the day to try to get Susan Hendricks on the phone to no avail. Now, to further things along here, Captain, Susan Hendricks and the kids were scheduled to go to Susan's brother's house for dinner that Tuesday evening. They never arrive. Now, this is where people are starting to get concerned. So David, being out on the road, having not been able to get a hold of his wife for the entirety of that day, he's now concerned, and he thinks, well, no big deal. Something may have come up. Maybe she's running around, what have you. She'll be at her brother's house. I'll call there. Well, what we see in all these cases is there's a big red flag moment. And so, okay, I can't get a hold of them. There could be a reason. They're definitely going to go to her brother's house later. And when they don't end up there, boom, that's your big red flag. You know, sound all the alarms and and bells and whistles. So this is interesting because we have multiple people to confirm what time this takes place. Susan and the kids were, you know, hey, come over at 530. And Susan says, yes, we'll be there at 530. David is on the phone with his in-laws at 540 p.m. on that Tuesday. In-laws say, nope, she's not here yet. And now both are immediately concerned because she was very prompt. Right. Susan was very prompt. And on top of that, David's now telling her family, look, I've been trying to get a hold of her all day and cannot. And so now David calls the Bloomington Police Department. And from my understanding, the the relatives on the other end of that call that sounds the alarm, they offered to call because he's in another state. But I think David wanted to make sure that nobody got confused as to his concern. So he says, no, I'm going to call the police myself. So he's on the phone with Bloomington police department, Bloomington police. They offer to go to the Hendricks home and check. And he says, well, I don't think they're home. I've been calling all day. And in fact, by this point, he says, I've even talked to a neighbor who lives a couple doors down, who told me that they went over and knocked And nobody answered the door. So I don't think that they're home. And the police say, well, what about the car? Was the car in the driveway? He says, well, that wouldn't matter. I think they've been in some kind of accident is my concern, a vehicle accident. And that's why the cops ask about the car in the driveway. And he says, it doesn't matter because she always parks in the garage. So you wouldn't know if they were there based off of that or not. Right. So the police are saying, well, maybe we should go check the house. David is saying, I don't think they're there. I have other people telling me that they're not there. I'm worried that they had an accident. It's a 35-minute drive from our home to 
where they were going for dinner in Devlin. I'm worried that something happened to them along the way. And so the police department says, all right, we're going to get in touch with the sheriff's office, the county, you know, because they operate the county as their jurisdiction. And we'll see if there's been any reported accidents in the area or if there are anybody at the hospitals. I, I believe he even states like, I think this is where they're heading. And I think this is the direction they would have went. Yeah. He says, yes, this is their destination. And typically when we go there, we take Stringtown. Right. Is the name of the the road that they are on for most of that trip. So now that gives police somewhere to look for these individuals. However, they very quickly know that there's not been any reported accidents within that time period of when they would have been traveling. So now we get to a point where we learn that there's no accidents. All of this conversation first starts at 540 with the in-laws. So several several minutes are going to go by by the time that he talks to everybody. But what David says is that once her family became that concerned and once he finds out that there have been no reported accidents, he decides he's got to get home pronto. So David is staying or attempting to stay at a motel in Madison, Wisconsin. So he's about roughly a three hour drive from Bloomington, Illinois. Right. He says upon this level of concern and talking with the in-laws and after talking to police, he checked out immediately. He gathered his things. He loaded up the car and he's now headed back home. We know that he arrives home and finds this horrific scene with police already on the scene. Police are telling us, Captain, that there was no sign of forced entry into that home. In fact, they say that not only was that sliding glass door at the rear of the home found unlocked, possibly slightly ajar, right? but the front door was found unlocked as well. So they've checked the entire house. Uh, police chief would, he's addressing the local news and he would not say if the house was robbed or if they had any idea as to motive for these horrific murders. Well, anybody that grew up with a sliding glass door knew that like those locks were finicky yeah. and you could almost like just keep messing with the door and sometimes it would just kind of come unlocked. And so you have that unlocked front door, but that doesn't mean somebody entered that way, but it could be that maybe somebody exited that way. Exactly. And sliding glass door people put like a broomstick or something down there for when you don't actually make the connection to, to lock that door. So there's something to jam that door for people from the outside. Now, police do say that they found a sharp object in a bedroom. So they're being... They're, they're giving us some detail, but being a little vague with it, right? We found a sharp object in a bedroom that could have been the murder weapon, but the police chief would not describe this item in detail to the news. Now, the, the news, on the other hand, was telling the public, saying that the murder weapon was an axe, or that the at least the news believed that the murder weapon was an axe. Right. The county coroner would only say that the autopsies revealed, quote, massive cerebral and various internal injuries on each of the victims. It was done with a sharp object. And just quickly to back up to your point of the putting a stick or a broom handle into the sliding glass door, I couldn't find anywhere where they said whether they had something like that or not. Well, what we do know, and we're basing this off of David Hendricks' right. account, he because he's questioned that night, and a, in fact, he's actually questioned at length that night, which is a little rough considering his situation, right, the, that he's walking into and the lack of sleep that he's had within the last 24 to 48 hours. Well, and he spent the last, what, 12 hours trying to get a hold of his family members, so he's worrying, and now he has a three-hour trip back home. He comes to this crime scene. His wife has been murdered, viciously murdered. Yes. And then his three children have been viciously murdered as well. Exactly. And so he says, 
you know, they, they don't ask him specifically if they would ever wedge anything to stop the, the door from opening. Right. But they ask him about the doors. You know, did you, did you, what happened when you left? Yeah. Did you lock the doors? And, and look, as far as law enforcement goes, you know that there's, you know, I, uh, there's a part of you that probably goes, Hey, it's in poor taste that we interview this guy or that we not, not just interview him, but we got to kind of interrogate this guy. Cause look, he's the number one suspect because you, he's the one that's closest to all of them. And you have to ask him now, even though his emotions might not be intact because he could be, he could be the killer and you you're losing time. Uh, and also you don't want to give somebody time to get their story straight. Yeah. And I think of it as a, a bit of a double edged sword, right? So what we have here is not only could this guy be your suspect, right? Because the statistics would tell you that when you have an entire family, but one wiped out, usually the one is responsible. So that's the unfortunate statistics. So they would tell you that this is the guy you should probably be looking at. But then on the other hand, you have this, well, even if this is not your suspect, we have to talk to him and squeeze every detail out of him and every bit of information we can out of him because even if he didn't kill them, he might be the last one to have seen them alive before the killer did. But he is also the only surviving member of the family, so he has... Um, information about the crime scene that nobody else would have. Exactly. So when they're asking him about details of the night before, he's saying a couple of things. When I left the house, and, and I'm going based off of the questions they chose to ask him that night. Did you lock the doors before you left? Because we found them unlocked. You know, they're probably not telling him we found them unlocked, but he's saying, did you lock the doors before you leave? Right. And he said, well... I believe that I did. That was my routine that when I would go on these trips that I would lock the doors or even when I would go to work or anywhere, I would lock the doors before I would leave the house. And he specifically references the back door first. He says, I think that I locked the back door. The front door was locked. I got in my car and left, but I did not lock the door from the garage into the house. Right. I, and I closed the garage door behind me as I was pulling out and leaving the house. Yeah. Now, the other thing that he tells them is that his wife and children were in bed and that his wife was awake when he left. And the kids, as far as he knew, were asleep. And so that he left and he went on this trip. Now, to further give detail to this regard about David Hendricks being talked to that night, he was, in fact, interviewed for approximately eight hours. Some reports say eight and a half hours. And we can question. I think we should question this. Because this information would later be coming from David Hendricks and from the individual that he would hire as an attorney to represent him. Now, of course, he should have representation, but if your attorney's talking to the newspaper and wants to get and gain sympathy for you, right. his client, he might exaggerate a little bit how long that the distraught father who had just seen his whole family killed and just was notified of that, of how terrible and rude the police were to interview this guy. And Oh, not only did they interview him on his worst night life of his life ever, but they kept him there for eight and a half hours. Can you imagine? Yeah. They treated him like an animal. So I, I don't know that I fully believe that he was there for eight and a half hours. Um, but the, what it made its way to the newspapers, according to David's attorney is that he was interviewed for approximately eight to eight and a half hours after the bodies were found and questioned very early on. And a lot of this questioning took place at the actual police station. And 
what we learn here is that very early on, right away, David is like, yes, no problem. You search the house. Of course, they probably don't need his permission to search the house at this point. But he's saying, search my car, search my motorcycle, make sure you search my airplane that's at the hangar. Um, and so police, they search all of these locations. And then on top of that, they even drive the route that they believe that he would have taken from Bloomington out to Wisconsin. And they drive it back to Bloomington as well. They, they check and search the hotel room that he checked into. And on the way back, they're looking for if he would have discarded of anything along the way. So police are obviously on to this dude right away, and they have doubts about David Hendricks and his story right away. We were talking about how he called, and he was calling all day trying to get a hold of his wife, figure out where she was at and why wasn't she answering his phone calls. But if you look at the transcripts of those calls, one of the things that I find strange, if I'm law enforcement, is how he keeps pointing out that he's out of town. Yeah. and But that's one of those things where it's like, but if he is out of town, I guess it's not that strange that he keeps pointing that out. Yeah, th that's where – so what we're going to see with this case, Captain, is that this, this case is so interesting because of the evidence and also the lack thereof evidence. And then you, you just t mentioned it right there and then. You hit the nail on the head. This is a double-sided coin. Almost every detail in this story is a double-sided coin. Is it heads or is it tails, right? David Hendricks is reminding the police, I was at, I was out of state. I was on business. I w hit all these different locations. I spoke to my secretary. I spoke to uh, extended family. I tried to get a hold of Susan. Well, that is absolutely true. Every bit of that is absolutely true. Now, is it tails where he's trying to establish an alibi? Right. It could It could be both. And so you have this situation, and let's throw in another double-sided coin, okay? Heads or tails. The police say, well, it's awfully suspicious that when we asked David Hendricks, did you lock the doors before you left? And David goes right to the sliding gra glass door with his answer. I think I locked the back door. I know the front door was locked. Right. And the door to the garage I did not lock, and then I left, and the garage door closed as I was pulling out police go well we entered the home through the back door that's suspicious that his mind went to the back door first rather than the front door and i agree with what police are saying i think that most people's minds would go to the front door first of but, course but here's the problem we don't know did police when they first start talking to him at his house before he even goes to the police station do they say hey we came in through the back door and, and we found this scene we found your wife and then right. So, so if, if that was a conversation that was had or information that was given to him, of course, his mind would go to the back door first. Right. And that's, what's difficult in a lot of these cases. Like when we hear a 911 call, we, we examine and we start thinking, well, what we, what would we say? What would we do? Because if I'm innocent, then I would do this. If I was guilty, I'd do this. And like you said, if I'm talking to law enforcement and they're saying, hey, we entered through the back door and the back door was ajar or the back door was unlocked, I'd probably, when questioned about, did I lock the doors, I'd probably start with the one that you entered. Here's another one. Heads or tails. The police say Heads. This, is, this is about 24 to 48 hours after finding the bodies. Right. The police tell the local news. We have some concerns about David Hendricks because he didn't seem to be surprised, shocked, or incredibly upset. We don't think that he behaved or acted the way that we would anticipate one that one should act when discovering that their whole family's been killed. Okay, so that's heads. The tales of that is the neighbors and his family, this is David's family and Susan's family. The neighbors and the extended family say the exact opposite. David was a wreck. He was destroyed. These people know him better than the police do. Right. But let's go back to. But also it's like, it's also after the fact. 
Yes. So it, it goes back to the whole thing. Well, well, my client was, I mean, heck, police had him there for eight hours. And then the police go, well, you know what? <laughs> when we're talking to, when we're talking to David, he didn't seem too upset about anything. And then the people that are on his side, well, upset. He he wasn't just upset. He he was destroyed. And with all of these coin flips, you know, one thing that I think would have really helped out this case that we just didn't have because it wasn't typical protocol for 1983 is that period of time. You're exactly right, Captain. What we have here is we have several different witnesses who have different opinions, varying opinions of David in his emotional state when he's at the home that night when he discovers that his family has been killed, right? We have the neighbors and family saying, oh, he was, he was a wreck. He was destroyed. The police saying he's not acting as upset as we would think one would act. What we don't have is anyone but David's word versus the police's word. Once they are back at the police station, we don't have, that's why it's so important that these interviews are now videotaped these days in almost every jurisdiction. Right. Because what we would have here with us today, we would be able to play back those recordings and be go, and be able to make our own observations and say, yeah, I think that detective is right. David doesn't seem to be, he seems to be awfully casual when he's seated at the table with the police answering questions during that eight hours or whatever it was back at the police station. Or this man's a wreck. He's completely lost. His mind is, is gone. He doesn't know how to answer these questions because of the situation, what he's just been through. Yeah. But think about that though. It's like, again, and you're using the heads and tails analogy. And I think it's a really good one because if I'm law enforcement and you go, man, this guy, this guy seems like he's losing his mind. It's like, well, that could be a guy that lost his family and knows that his family was brutally murdered and he wasn't there to stop it. He wasn't there to save them. But on the other hand, you could go, well, he's losing his mind because he just killed his whole family. It's, you can, it, it, it's almost just like maybe the answers tell uh, or what you think your opinion tells us more about you than it does the actual suspect. So heads or tails, we have David Hendricks who tells police, yes, I'll go to the police station with you. Yes, I'll sit across the table from you and I'll answer any of your questions. And according to his attorney, he's there for eight and a half hours that night after discovering his family's been killed and after not having hardly any sleep from traveling and and working for 48 hours. But then the flip of that, you know, David, before we get to the flip, David says, yes, search the house, search my cars, search my motorcycle, the the airplane, and and please search the hotel room that I checked into. No problem. Search whatever you need to. I, I, you know, I'm an open book. The flip to that is then he's asked if he would take a polygraph. And David says, well, I don't know if I trust the polygraph test. This is 1983. Keep in mind in 1983. And I don't want to get an email because every time one comes up, I get an email from somebody who goes, you know, it's not admissible in court. Duh. This ain't our first, ain't our first garage show here. Yeah. Well, you're going to get a reply that says, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> Duh. D U H. Um Yeah, but what we've said in the past and it's true. Where's the plus side? If I take one and I pass with flying colors, then people are going to say, "Yeah, but we don't know if those tests are correct." And then if I fail, then it nobody's going to come to my rescue and say, "Well, those tests aren't always correct. It's, I think it's actually more difficult to say because it's 40 years ago. I think because it was 1983 that there's a good solid chance that if he would have taken the test and passed with flying colors, that they may have moved on from David Hendricks, given the time period. Yeah, but look at uh, and, the Ramsey case. I mean, they took three polygraph tests and passed, and they didn't move on. But David tells police that he has a reason for not trusting the polygraph exam. And he says, look, a friend of mine, remember this man is very religious, the Plymouth brethren community that he's involved in. 
very religious. And he says this individual that I know who's who I consider to be an extremely honest man and religious man had to take a polygraph exam for his work and failed the polygraph and lost his job because of the test, the results of that exam. And so David is telling police, I don't, I don't feel comfortable taking the exam. Number one, because of this experience that I know of. And so I don't trust these tests, but I might consider taking it, but I wouldn't do it until I have an attorney. So what we learned by that statement is he sat there with police, according to his attorney that he hires at a later time for eight to eight and a half hours that night without any representation. He's not requested representation, but he's sitting there with nothing in his arsenal answering the police's questions. And so the police say, well, this, we, this is a tool that we, that we will use to move on from you. And David says, well, what if I fail or what if it's inconclusive? And the police tell him, well, then we would probably focus our investigation on you. And to that, he then says, I think I'm going to need to get an attorney, which rightfully so. I mean, police are asking you these questions and they they've even said, look, we might be foc- We might be moving in and focusing our investigation in on you more as we proceed. So what we have here, Captain, is a little bit of back and forth because in the coming days, in the coming weeks, we will have the police chief and the, this is the county attorney, Ronald Dozier. He's openly telling the newspapers after a couple weeks that David Hendricks is not cooperating in the police's investigation into the murders. And you have his now attorney, Harold Jennings, who is telling the papers, look, my client cooperated fully in the early stages of their investigation for eight hours. And now that they, the, detectives seem to be honing in on him and refusing to look at anybody else. Yes. My client is reluctant to speak with the police. Yes. I've advised he's not taking the polygraph exam because I have advised him not to do so. In fact, his attorney, Harold Jennings, who officially wasn't hired yet because, because David Hendricks has not been charged with anything. But Harold Jennings is still representing him, as, at least as far as PR goes or in relation to communications with the police. But Jennings is saying, look, not only have I advised Hendricks to not take the polygraph exam, I've advised him to not speak with police at all unless I am present. And I want them to submit the questions to me in advance. Yeah, I mean, this is a common tactic for a lawyer and you pay a lawyer to protect you and protect your rights. We need to get through some of the events of the night leading up to the murders, right? Because the question still is, we know that they were killed either late Monday night or early Tuesday morning, but we really need to be able to hone in and isolate the time of death for these victims. We know that David Hendricks was at the house until a certain point that Monday night. And what also makes this difficult for me, I don't care about all you other people, what it does for me is if I'm law enforcement, it's a three-hour drive. So it's very possible that David drives, checks into the hotel, makes some calls, does some stuff, and then drives back home, commits the murders, drives back. Yeah, but keep in mind, we we have a couple of things going on here. He's hitting multiple stops. That's the intention for the sales pitch right. to going to these different practices. His first location that he goes to is a little more than six hours away from his home. He Where he ends up when he drives back home is three hours away. Right, but what I'm saying is since we can't, we don't have a, his, a cell phone where we can track his uh, locations. We can only track it when, when he's uh, 
entering a point where he's exiting a point, right? If people saw him or didn't see him, right? So what I'm saying is there can be gaps in his travel that we could be unaware of. Does that make any sense? No, it does. But keep in mind, we also have some markers along the way that are that right. should back up his location. So we know that he's making phone calls from um, pay phones. We also know that he's making a phone call, at least one phone call, probably multiple phone calls from the motel room. So all of that, because it's long distance and because it's a pay phone, we can track that and we can confirm, Hey, you said you were making this phone call at this time. All right, well, let's double check. Okay. Yes. We see that you were making that phone call at this time. Plus we have him checking in and speaking with other individuals. It's not just, I called Susan. Nobody answered. It's I spoke with my secretary at this time and at these different times on this day. And also he was active. He, he was actively going into different practices and giving his sales pitch and networking with these individuals throughout the course of that Tuesday. Yeah. Cause I understand if you're in law enforcement, like we said, he's the only survivor of this family. So he would know critical information about the house and about the neighborhood, about uh, their friends and families, uh, possible people that could be connected or possible people that law enforcement should be looking into so you're going to question him on that. But if you're law enforcement, I think the first thing that you have to do instead of trying to get him to confess or take a polygraph or whatever is to go, did he have means and opportunity to actually commit these crimes? And here's one of the problems for your case. If your case is to build a case against David Hendricks, this scene and I don't want to I don't want to dance in the details for too long because it's horrific and heartbreaking to discuss. This is an incredibly bloody, brutal scene. What we would learn is that the victims were killed with at least two weapons, sharp objects, one an axe. This is not a hatchet. This is a long handle axe. They were also killed with a butcher knife. Now, both of those items belong to the Hendricks family. The axe belonged to the family. The butcher knife came from the butcher's block in the kitchen. The individuals had their, some of them had their throats slit and every single one of them were hit multiple times directly in the face with a long handled axe. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times. We're talking Individuals being struck directly in the face while they lay there defenseless and silent 10 to 13 times each. There was blood everywhere at this scene. Whoever killed them should have blood on their person, on their clothing, and on places that they cannot detect or disguise or hide. The problem for the police with the scientific evidence very quickly became this. In David's motorcycle, airplane, his car that he drove to Wisconsin, zero victim's blood found in any of those locations. His clothing that he took with him, his luggage that he took with him, the items for business purposes that he took with them, Zero blood on all of those items. The hotel room that he checked into and stayed at briefly. Zero victims blood found at that location as well. And we're not talking about, we're just testing it with the naked eye. We're talking about 1983. They are doing their damn best to try to find blood somewhere that the victim's blood got outside of this house because that's your trail to the killer. They took that car apart down to the nuts and bolts looking for blood in his vehicle. They did not find it. They went through that motel room to the point that they were dipping and checking and taking apart the drains to the sink and to the bathtub. No blood found in those locations either. No blood found in the traps 
or the drains at the Hendricks home. So they don't have anything indicating to a great degree that the killer completely cleaned themselves upon before leaving the crime scene. They, they drove the route multiple times that he would have taken, or they believed that he would have taken from Bloomington to his destination, roughly six hours away. Didn't find anything discarded along the way. Could he have done a really damn good job? Maybe. But the, all the items that they tested, every location that they searched, they did not find any victim's blood. So that is difficult for your investigation. That's the physical evidence that was going to lead you to your killer. They find the ax. They find the knife that was used to kill all four members of the family. They find those two items lying on the floor in the girl's bedroom where three of the victims were found. Now they have to interview David Hendricks because the big part of their case and their investigation is simply going to be this because we didn't find any blood evidence leading us to David Hendricks, but yet we don't believe him and we don't trust him. He won't take our polygraph exam. We need to figure out the time of death. That's going to be key here because if we can then prove that he was still at home during the time of death, then he had to be the one that killed his family. There's no way around it. So scientifically, you have the coroner, you have the experts, medical examiners, pathologists, all trying to determine the time of death for these four victims. Right. Meanwhile, you have the police getting statements from David Hendricks on the night of the, the, the bodies are discovered, getting a timeline from him for that Monday. Because if they can prove that they were all killed late Monday night rather than early Tuesday morning, David Hendricks may still have been in the house when they were killed. He's our killer. So they talk to David and they get some information from him. The interesting thing from his story of that Monday night is again, we're going to have markers, witnesses, people that can back up portions of his story to be absolute fact agreed upon fact. Right. So let's start off roughly around five, five thirty. So for this first marker on our timeline of events, we don't have an exact time, but what it is, is it's a neighbor, an adult neighbor who says my kids we're out playing with the Hendrix kids in the Hendrix front yard and around this five to five 30, maybe even closer to six o'clock, Susan Hendrix comes outside to the door and she calls her kids in for the evening. Okay. So kids and mom alive and well at this time, we don't have an exact time for it, but what we do know that takes place is that sometime shortly after that, David Hendrix takes his three children to a mall. They're at the mall very briefly. They were shopping for something. I can't remember exactly what it was. But after the mall, they go to a nearby Chuck E. Cheese restaurant for dinner. Now, why is it just dad and the three kids? Well, mom, Susan Hendricks, is attending a baby shower that evening. So she's off and alive and well and visiting friends at the baby shower. That's not in dispute. Now, one thing that will become very important to this case will be that while there, the family of four split a vegetable pizza. Thank you everyone for joining us here in the garage today. If you are a member of law enforcement or a first responder and you have a case from your jurisdiction that you would like for us to feature here in the garage, Please go to truecrimegarage.com and look up our contact information. So much more to get to. Join us back here in the garage tomorrow. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.